God has told us to go and tell the world about his love for people and the place that he doesn't want any of his creation to go to. I would say, how do you know it was, wasn't just a dream that you had, a bad dream? First of all, I had left my body. I saw my body when I returned, laying on the floor. This, I believe, comes under the classification of a vision. And in Job 7.14, it says, Thou scarest me with dreams, and terrifiest me through visions. It took me a year to calm down. I was so traumatized from the fear that it's changed my whole viewpoint and how much to appreciate what God saved us from. I asked my wife to come up for a minute. It was about 3.23 in the morning when I woke up and I found my husband in a fetal position on our living room floor. He cried out and said, pray that the Lord would take this out of my mind. The Lord took me to hell. Like someone who went to Vietnam and has a reoccurrence or a horrible car accident where they're reliving it. It was not just someone who just had a bad dream and woke up. First of all, I wanted to find out when I got back from this experience if there's anybody in the Bible that had ever experienced hell. And so I began to research and I found in Jonah 2.2 it says in hell he cried out. And in Jonah 2.6 he says the earth with her bars was about me forever, yet thou hast brought up my life from corruption. Any spiritual experience that you would go through should already be in the Word of God. So I began to research and I found over 400 scriptures that depicted everything I saw, heard, felt. I also found there were about 14 other people that had experienced some portion of hell. Most of them were near-death experiences, people in the hospital dying or, and that were brought back. My wife and I were at a Sunday night prayer meeting that we always attend with our pastors and we went home like any other normal night and went to bed and about three o'clock in the morning uh, I was taken. I did not know how I got there until I returned, the Lord explained, but I was just found myself, I dropped into a prison cell with rough hewn stone walls and bars on the, on the door. And I didn't know where I was yet. All I knew that it was extremely, terribly hot. It was so hot, I couldn't believe that I was alive in this cell. In uh, Isaiah 24, 22, it says, And they shall be gathered together as prisoners are gathered in the pit and shall be shut up in the prison. Proverbs 7, 27 says, They shall go down to hell to the chambers of death. Chambers means in a room. So part of hell has prison cells. And then there's a scripture in Jonah 2, 6, The earth with her bars was about me forever. I found myself in this cell, and these four creatures were in the cell with me. So I went there as an unsaved person. God took it out of my mind that I was a Christian. I didn't understand why, but he explained that to me on the way back, which I'll get to. And so these creatures were all scaly. This one was all scale, giant jaw sticking out with huge teeth and sunken in eyes. The whole time they were cursing God. And then they turned their attention to me and I felt the same hatred that they had for God, but they hated me with a hatred that I've never experienced on earth. And I knew they were assigned to me to torture me. I noticed I was laying on the floor of the cell and I had absolutely no strength in my body. And I wonder why can't I hardly move? What is wrong with me? And I was just real aware of that. My wife and I like to work out and, and I just was aware of no strength. And I was helplessly laying there. And the one um, demon just grabbed me and picked me up and threw me into the wall like a glass, like he would pick up a glass. Every bone in my body just broke. I felt it break. And I felt the pain. And I, I was crying out for mercy, but these creatures don't have any mercy at all. The one picked me up, the other one, with those razor sharp claws and things, and he just shredded my flesh right off. He just tore it off and had absolutely no care whatsoever for, the, for this body that God has so fearfully and wonderfully made. They, and the flesh just hung in ribbons and there was no water or blood, just flesh hanging because life is in the blood and there's no life in hell and there's no water in hell and in Isaiah 14 9 and 10 it says hell from beneath is moved to meet thee at thy coming they shall say art thou become weak as we 
Psalms 88, 4 says, I am counted with them that go down into the pit. I am as a man that has no strength. The smell of these demons and the smell in hell was so atrocious. It, it's like if you took, there was a smell of burning flesh, of sulfur. There was a smell of the demons were like, like an open sewer, putrid and rotten meat or bad eggs and milk and everything you can imagine. Take it times a thousand and put it up to your nose and just breathe that in. It was so toxic it would kill you if you were here in this body. And I wondered why am I living again through this smell. It's just so horrendous. But again, you don't die. You have to endure it. The torments that they were doing on me, it's mentioned in Deuteronomy 32, 22 through 24, it says, For a fire is kindled in my anger and shall burn into the lowest hell. They shall be burnt with hunger and devoured with burning heat and with bitter destruction. I will also send the teeth of beasts upon them with the poison of serpents of the dust. 2 Samuel 22, 6 talks about the sorrows of hell can pass me about. And in Micah 3, 2, there's an interesting scripture that says the Philistines who hate the good and love evil, who pluck off their skin from off them and their flesh from off their bones. That's what they did to the Jewish people. So that's in the natural, that's what they did. But where do they get that idea from? That comes from hell. There's only mercy in heaven. Mercy comes from God. Psalms 36, 5, thy mercy, O Lord, is in the heavens. And in Psalm 74, 20, it says, for the dark places of the earth are full of the habitations of cruelty. God has made mankind the highest form of creation, and these demons were the lowest form of creation. And as man, we, we work hard to get ahead in life, we better ourselves, we study, and all the things we do. And here in hell, your life is run by a demon. All they know is hatred for God and hatred for you, and torture, and you can't do anything about it. In Isaiah 5.14 it says, Therefore hell hath enlarged herself, and opened her mouth without measure, and the mighty man shall be humbled. I um, was laying in the cell, and it went dark, a darkness which I have never, ever felt before. And I've been down in iron mines and so forth in Arizona, and, and I managed to crawl out, and all I heard was screams, people, billions of people screaming in this place. And it was so loud. If you ever heard somebody scream before, it's so annoying to hear a scream. Well, to hear billions of people screaming, you can't believe how that affects your mind. And the fear that overcomes you is unbelievable. Because it's dominated by fear. There is no presence of God in this place. So you have to endure the fear and the torment and the blackness. You can't see anything. You can't even see now what's coming up. Psalms 88.6, in darkness in the deep. Revelation 16.10, full of darkness. It was, you could feel this darkness. And uh, the fear was so powerful, gripped you. And, and I know something about fear. At one point, I used to surf when I was young. We were in uh, Cocoa, Florida surfing, and there was a school of sharks came all around us. About a nine foot tiger shark came up and bit my board right in half. And it grabbed me by the leg and pulled me down. And so my leg was in the mouth of this giant shark. And I wasn't a Christian then. This was before I was even saved. And all of a sudden it let me go. I know God let that open that shark's mouth. The fear was terrifying. And the guy next to me, just a couple of feet away, the shark ripped his leg right off. And they drug him up on the beach and, and blood everywhere. And he was screaming and had no leg. So I understand fear, but that fear was nothing, absolutely nothing compared to the fear I felt in hell. No comparison at all. And, and I think that was one of the greatest fears we could experience on earth. It says in Isaiah 24, 17, fear in the pit and the snare are upon thee and noise of the fear. And, and Ted Koppel in a, a presentation he did on the Nightline he visited some uh, prison in our country and he spent the night there and he couldn't believe how loud it was that you couldn't sleep everybody's screaming at the top of their lungs he said so even in our earthly prisons people are screaming where how much more in hell uh, in Job 18 14 it says um, the wicked ways of man person that rejects the Lord it shall bring him to the king of terrors 
The devil is definitely the king of terrors. I was outside now in the cell. I could see a little, there was flames of fire. The flames lit up the skyline enough to see the landscape of hell just a little bit. The darkness is so heavy, it just eats up any light. But there was enough to just see a little bit of the skyline. And it was all brown, desolate, just stone and dirt and uh, black sky, the smog in the sky like. Deuteronomy 29, 23 says, the whole land is brimstone and salt and burning. It's absolutely all death and dead there. The heat was so intense. It says in uh, Deuteronomy 32, 22, you shall be devoured with a burning heat, suffering eternal fire in Jude 7. In Psalms 11, 6, it shall rain fire and brimstone and a horrible tempest. All these things should kill you, but you don't die from that. I wanted peace of mind to get away from the screams and just get out of there. Like if you want to go home at night when you have a day when it's been noisy or a rough day, you just want peace of mind. Well, there you're enduring all the screaming and torment, and you never ever get away from it. And in Isaiah 57 21, it says, There is no peace, saith my God, to the wicked. You're also naked in hell. It's just another thing to have to endure, a shame. Job 26 6 says, Hell is naked before him, and destruction has no covering. Now that means God can see into hell, so it's, it's observable to him. There is no water in hell at all. It is so dry, you are desperate for a drop of water. In Luke 16, 23 and 24, the rich man said, And in hell he lift up his eyes, being in torments, and seeing Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus, that he may dip the tip of his finger in water, and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. He wanted him to just dip the tip of his finger in water, just to get one drop. That would have been precious. If you can imagine doing a marathon run through Death Valley and having cotton in your mouth and staying there for days, and it just continues like that. Uh, the, one of the demons grabbed me and drug me back into the cell and began, uh, this began all these torments again, which I really hate to talk about that part because I just don't like to have to relive the torment. And they began to crush my skull. About this time, they each grabbed an arm and a leg and were about to tear off my legs and arms. And I thought, I can't endure this, I can't endure this. And something grabbed me all of a sudden and pulled me out of the cell. I know it was the Lord, but then I didn't know that. I was there as an unsaved person. And I was placed over next to the fire that I had seen. I was standing alongside that tunnel going up. And alongside the fire, I could see bodies, people in the fire, screaming for mercy burning in this place and these people were begging to get out and there were these big creatures lined all around the edge of it and as the people clawed up trying to get out they would be shoved back in all this is going on at the same time you're you're thirsty and you're hungry and you're you're exhausted you don't get to sleep in hell either you need sleep just like you would now Revelation 14 11 says and the smoke of their torment ascends up forever and ever and they have no rest day nor night Hell's location is in the center of the earth Ephesians 4 9 it says Jesus descended into the lower parts of the earth number 16 32 says the earth opened her mouth and swallowed them up and they went down alive into the pit and the earth closed upon him that's where hell is right now uh, later hell and death will be cast into the lake of fire and it says that'll be cast into outer darkness That's after judgment day, but right now it is in the earth I saw all these demons all lined up in the in along the walls uh, huge ones small ones there were giant spiders and rats and snakes and worms Because the Bible talks about worms uh, that cover thee Isaiah 14 11 there were all kind of abominable creatures everywhere. They seem to be chained to the walls. But uh, there's a scripture on that where Jude 6 says, And the angels which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation, he hath reserved in everlasting chains under darkness unto the judgment of the great day. So they weren't just creatures, they had a hatred towards mankind. 
and they they had such uh, awesome power. But who could fight off these creatures? No one could fight these things. The worst thing in hell, the worst thing, worse than the torments and everything else, was I understood, first of all, that there was a life going on up here on the earth. And that most people had no idea that this world exists down here. Billions of people suffering and begging for one chance that they had an opportunity to get out. And being mad at themselves for not taking the opportunity to, to have received Jesus. You have, this is the worst thing about hell was that there was absolutely no hope of ever getting out. I understood that. I grasped eternity. I could understand eternity. But I knew that I would be there forever and ever and ever and no, have no hope of getting out. And I, and I thought about my wife, you know, and I've always told her, if we were ever separated, I will find you. I'll get to you if we're ever apart. And I couldn't get to her. You understand? You never get out of here, ever. See, on Earth, there's always hope. Even people in concentration camps had a hope of getting out or dying, at least, to get out of it. But we've never experienced a totally hopeless situation. And in Isaiah 38, 8, 18, it says, They shall go down into the pit and cannot hope for thy truth. No hope. And the truth is Jesus. He is the truth. About this time, we're going up a tunnel, and I'm just in absolute fear and hopelessly lost and fearing these demons all of a sudden just all of a sudden Jesus showed up this bright light lit up the place I, I, I only saw his outline I couldn't see his face it was so bright and I just looked into this light and saw his outline and I just fell on my knees and collapsed I couldn't do anything but worship him. I was so grateful that one second ago I was lost forever. And now all of a sudden I'm out of this place. Because I already had known Jesus. Those people can't get out. But because I was already saved, there is no way out of this place. Only by Jesus. He is the only way to keep from going to this place. And in Revelation 1.6 it says, John when he went to heaven, it says, and, his, and he saw Jesus, and his countenance was as the sun that shineth in his strength. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as a dead man. That's just how I did. I fell at his feet like a dead man. When you're there, all you can do is worship him and praise his holy name and thank him for what he saved us from. I thought, Lord, why did you send me to this place? And he said to me, because people do not believe that this place exists. He said, even some of my own people do not believe this place is real. He said, go tell them that I hate this place. That is not my desire for one of my creation to go to this place, not one. I never made this for man. This was made for the devil and his angels. You have to go and tell them. I've given you a mouth, you go and tell them. And I thought to myself, but Lord, they're not going to believe me. They're going to think I'm crazy or had a bad dream. And the Lord answered me and he said, it's not your job to convict them. It's the Holy Spirit's job. You just go and tell them. You can't worry and fear what man's going to think of you. You just have to go and do it and let God do the rest. I said, Lord, why did they hate me so much? And he said, because you're made in my image and they hate me. About this time, God flooded me with his thoughts. I, I, he let me touch a piece of his heart of how much he loves mankind. The love he has for man, you can't take it in this body. We love our wives, our children. Well, that love we have can't even be compared to the love God has for us. If his love is infinitely greater than our love and our ability, Ephesians 3.19, to know the love of Christ, which passes knowledge. I couldn't believe how he loved mankind, that he would die for just one person to not go to this place. And it hurt him so much to see one of his creation go into this place. It pains the Lord. He weeps to see one person go on, And I felt so bad for the Lord. I felt like his heart, he allowed me to just touch a piece of his heart to where he felt such sadness for his creation going there. And I thought, I've got 
to go out and witness and take every last breath I have and go tell the world about Jesus, how good he is. It's good news, and the world doesn't know. They have to be told. You know, we have to share knowledge. People just have lack of knowledge in this area. God wants us to share with them how good he is and how he hates this place. He said to me also, he said, tell them I am coming very, very soon. And he said it again, tell them I'm coming very, very soon. And then when I looked up and I saw those demons on the wall that were so ferocious, they look like ants on the wall with the power of God next to you. All of God's creative power. I mean, they look like ants on the wall. I couldn't get over it. And, and I thought, oh, they're just ants. And he said, you just have to bind them and cast them out in my name. We uh, went above the earth's surface. When we got up to the top of it, uh, we were, uh, I looked down at the earth. It's awesome to look back at the earth. And I know God allowed that for me. Uh, he could have left that tunnel any which way he wanted. He knew in my heart, as a kid, I always wanted to see what the earth looked like from space. And to see it hung on nothing, like the Bible says. It says in Job 26.7, he hangeth the earth upon nothing. And you look at it and think, what's holding this up? What's making it turn so perfectly? God is in such control. The power of God that flooded me, that he has, it's awesome. He has so much power. Every single thing is in his control. Not a hair on your head falls to the ground that he doesn't know about. Not a bird hits the ground that he doesn't know about. And it's just, I was flooded with these thoughts. Of, God has so much power. And, and there's a scripture that says in Isaiah 40, 22, the Lord sits upon the circle of the earth. And there I was on the circle of the earth. And, and I even thought, Lord, you know, how come in, before uh, Christopher Columbus, they could have read that scripture and known the earth was round, you know? came up to my, our house and I looked and I could see right through the roof of our house and I could see myself laying on the floor and that scripture where Paul said we're just in a tent that hit me so strong I thought that's just a tent that's nothing it's temporary this is the real me this is what eternity is all about that life that we worry about that that we have, it, it hit me also about the vapor you know that life is such a vapor in James 4 14 he talks about and how short this life is and I thought we've got to live for God what we do now here counts for eternity. We need to really get out there and preach the gospel and the good news because this is over with quick. Came up to my body and something pulled me back into my body right then when he left. That's when all the fear and the torture and the torment came back into my mind because it says in the Bible, perfect love casts out fear. So I was left next to perfect love all that time. So that left me, but when he left, all of a sudden, the, the fear and the horrors of hell entered my mind. You can't hold up under that kind of pressure. Your body isn't strong enough. God took it out. He left the memory, but took the trauma and the fear out. You have to ask yourself a question. You have to say, do I believe these people that what they saw is real? But more importantly, what the Word of God says about hell. Do you want to take that chance and think, no, I don't believe it. I don't believe that's real. You have to throw out all the Word of God and all of us trying to tell you, are you willing to take that chance with your whole eternity? And you know, you might be saying to yourself, well, I'm pretty good. I'm a pretty good person. I, I don't deserve that place. And you probably are pretty good compared to most people. We need to compare ourselves to God's standard. His standard is so much higher than ours. He says in the word, if you lie once, that makes you a liar. If you stole one thing in your life, that made you a thief. If you were angry without cause, if you didn't forgive someone that did something wrong against you, pray compared to the white snow. So we need to compare ourselves to God so we have need of a savior. God made it a free gift. He said in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the Father but by me. Stand up now when, the, when you have the chance. You don't know that you might die tomorrow and end up in that place. And whoever will call on the name of the Lord will be saved.
Jesus said, if you will confess me before men publicly, then I will turn and confess your name before my heavenly Father. But if you deny me before men, I will deny you before my Father. I want to ask you to do something. If you've never publicly declared Jesus Christ is my Savior, I made him the Lord of my life, or if you're unsure whether heaven is your eternal home, if you'll pray this prayer from the depths of your heart, God will save your soul and he'll give you an opportunity in the not too distant future for you to make it public. God, I believe in you. Say it out loud. You are my creator. I am a sinner. Jesus, I believe in you. You are the eternal Son of God. You're the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of this world, who takes away my sin. I believe you died on a cross, shedding your innocent blood for my guilty soul. I believe you were buried. On the third day you arose. You are alive forevermore. I call you my Lord. I call you my Savior. I give you my life. I will love you, serve you the rest of my days. I belong to you. All my plans, all my dreams, I give everything to you. Thy will be done in me. I believe I'm saved, not by good works, but by faith, by trust in you. In Jesus I pray. Amen. Why else have a relationship with anyone if not to share with them the glorious good news that saves their soul from hell? It's a, it's a felony in the spirit to know someone, to converse with them, to entertain yourselves with them, to enjoy their presence and never tell them without Christ they're going to hell. If you agree, say this to God. God, I believe in you. I receive the challenge of the hour. I declare of myself, I will no longer fear the face of man. I will not concern myself with the opinion of man. My reputation is of no importance. I hate the fear of man. I will tell everyone I know the rest of my life about you, Lord Jesus, about heaven and the place called hell. I will no longer be indifferent, preoccupied, not caring. Eternity is the next moment away. To see with clarity and order their priorities to obey God.